Uh, my name is Karen Patrone. Uh, I, first off, I wanted to welcome everybody uh, to this event. I am the director of the Cooperative for the Humanities and Social Sciences of the College of Arts and Sciences uh, at the University of Kentucky. Uh, and uh, we are uh, beginning a, a series of events uh, this fall and into the spring on crises and making social change. Uh, and uh, it is our great honor uh, to begin that uh, that event tonight, uh, 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 continue the, the series tonight uh, with Professor Michael Gooden. However, before we start any of the formal uh, proceedings, uh, it's good to have a little bit of uh, Zoom etiquette. Please uh, keep your, uh, your mics muted uh, and please also, uh, for now the video will be turned off. I don't know that we'll be able to turn the video on, uh, but after the presentation, there will be an opportunity uh, for you to, for us to have a discussion, um, and that discussion will uh, include uh, questions. You will be able to unmute at that point and ask your question, uh, or you can ask your question in the chat. Uh, so, uh, I, for uh, once again, I want to welcome everybody. I'm really uh, delighted that you're here, uh, and uh, I hope uh, that you will come look at the uh, CHSS website come look at our events. Uh, and also uh, there's a survey uh, for faculty to take about, uh, about uh, interdisciplinary work and community work that uh, we are doing. Um, if you'd like to become an affiliate of the Cooperative for the Humanities and Social Sciences, all we ask you to do is take this survey um, and, uh, and then you can uh, join as an affiliate. All right, uh, so I'd like to uh, turn uh, to welcome uh, Professor Michael Gooden. Uh, he, Michael Gooden was born in Kingston, Jamaica in the same year that interracial marriages were legalized in the United States. He migrated to Canada where he completed high school and received an undergraduate degree in biology and chemistry from Brock University. He received both MS and PhD degrees in plant pathology from the Pennsylvania State University. He conducted his postdoctoral training in plant virology at the University of California, Berkeley. And he's been faculty in the plant pathology department at the University of Kentucky since Canada Day 2002. His wife, Angelica Gooden, is a German plant biochemist trained in Switzerland, who is a co-founder of the local biotechnology company, Paratex. Their two children, Sophia, who's 17, and Joshua, who's 15, attend Lafayette High School. Michael Gooden is the 2018 American Society for Microbiology Honorary Lecturer in Diversity. He's the only plant virologist in the country serving on the National Institutes of Health Virology A study section. He serves on both the University Senate and the Undergraduate Council here at UK. He teaches the freshman course for the Agricultural and Medical Biotechnology Program. His website and blog, The Green Orange Cafe, was created to provide a platform for novel communication of scientific principles to the public in personally relevant ways. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Michael Gooden. Thank you, Karen. Uh, hello, everyone. I, it is polite at this point uh, to welcome one and then have a sort of grander salutations and, and form a, a community around why, why we're gathered. Um, but there are forces presently acting that, that keep us from forming a, a more perfect union. And so I, I, I will uh, have the salutations and, and welcome. I'm going to delay that for about 400 years uh, and we'll get to a point where I can actually have the proper welcome. So we have to go to places um, tonight where a lot of people have difficulty going. Um, and, and so if you find some of this talk difficult, what I want you to do is look at this uh, nice beach picture. This is the bay where the Black River in Jamaica uh, enters the Caribbean Sea. Um, there's a nice palm tree with some shade. And, and so just make a mental image or a screenshot. And if some of the discussion becomes difficult, then just come back and, and rest here uh, for a second. So before... Um, uh, I should launch it this way. So what I'd like to do, um, given the honor of this talk, I'd like to dedicate it to my parents. And I 
you'll, my mom, you'll see uh, it, meet her yeah, in a little bit. Um, but my father here um, <coughs> uh, was at the Bank of Jamaica. And uh, if you look at the shirt, um, it's this shirt, and, and he wore it while he was signing this Colombian uh, line of credit in, in 1977. So um, it's a bit of Jamaican history. Uh, my mom really likes uh, plants, so I have a piece of Australian uh, jade um, set in sort of a leaf pattern um, yeah, and uh, for her, but you'll meet her in a second. So. So the Black River in Jamaica is so called um, because of the <coughs> um, tannins from the mangrove uh, swamp that darkly stained the water. And it's a beautiful place that you should try to visit and it, take a nice uh, boat tour. Um, be careful though, uh, be respectful uh, of the ecology. Don't drop in the water because uh, they're crocodiles. Um, beautiful river and if you take a boat tour you'll come through this estuary uh, into the bay and if you hang a hang a left you'll come back to this bay to this beautiful uh, resort called Idler's Rest uh, and this is the view from the balcony of Idler's Rest and if you're so inclined uh, with a partner and you have some friends by you can uh, rent this little uh, uh, constru um, construction here and put a canopy on it and tie up some flowers and you can uh, build uh, a little shelter where you might want to form a, a more perfect union. And if you're going to form a more perfect union, then you have to be cognizant and kind of immerse yourself in the lessons of the past 400 years. And, 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 and Black River, Jamaica is a really great place uh, to immerse yourself uh, in that history. So um, let's do 400 years from a Jamaican perspective um, and start to look at some of the gravestones at, at the churches and stuff like that. We'll start in the 1600s. We could go to St. John's uh, Parish Church in, in Black River, and that has been witness to uh, 300 of the past uh, 400 years. And if we go in, um, we can meet people like the so-called Honorable um, Henry Gale Esquire, Custis and Colonel of the Parish of St. Elizabeth of the Island, who at the time of his death, at the tender age of 30, um, left a plantation inherited from his grandfather at the value of 60,000 pounds sterling. 45,000 pounds sterling of that 60 was the value of the 655 slaves that worked on his, his plantation. Uh, slaves were incredibly uh, expensive and he owned uh, 60, six, uh, 655 of them. The passing of David Shakespeare gets us to 1823. It is, it's lost to history if this Shakespeare is related to Robbie Shakespeare, the bass player, who teamed up with Sly Dunbar to become one of the foremost uh, rhythm sections in, in the music industry and really got their start uh, with Peter Tosh um, when he left the uh, uh, Whalers to form his own uh, independent uh, uh, band. <clears throat> So Jamaica um, and, and in the British territories, uh, slavery was abolished in uh, 1838. And we commemorate that um, in, in places around Jamaica like Emancipation Park uh, in New Kingston. And in order to sort of uh, celebrate that and, and memorialize and commemorate it, uh, we, we have erected uh, statues such as Redemption Song by uh, Laura Facey. And, you know, I think if Marcus Garvey was to see this, uh, these statues, um, I, I think he would say something like, up, up, you mighty race. And um, speaking of Garvey, when my uh, mother passed away, we were going through uh, her possessions. We found this uh, order of uh, service from the reinterment. So for those of you who don't know Garvey, he's a Jamaican-born activist who migrated to the United States um, and established the Universal uh, Negro Improvement Association uh, and the Pan-African Movement. And it's really the Garveyite generation 
that gave birth to uh, the civil rights uh, generation. So it's an important connection uh, of Jamaica to the United States. He died in England in 1940 and it was reinterred in 1964. Um, and I don't know if my mom was at the, um, the service, but I'd like to believe that she was, given that this was in her possessions. Um, other people who were uh, at the service, though, were the uh, Honorable uh, Edward Siaga and the father of um, then Michael Manley. And these political adversaries uh, would uh, precipitate the tribal wars uh, of the 1970s. And it was only through music, through the power of uh, someone like Bob Marley, who were able to bring these political foes on stage at the Peace Concert in 1976. Now, every country goes through uh, fights with itself and its sort of civil uh, unrest. And, and once you get through these unrest, um, it, it's a pursuit towards these national mottos that we have. So in Jamaica, out of many one people, or in the case of the United States, the Latin equivalent, e pluribus unum. But greater than in both of those is sort of the Jimmy Cliff, you know, we all are one. And I'll get back to that uh, sentiment uh, in a second. And so I'll, I'll end that 400 years um, from the Jamaican perspective, sort of the Jamaican 9-11, if you will, uh, is the murder of, of Peter Tosh. And Peter Tosh's music and Bunny Whaler and Bob Marley and all this generation uh, since uh, of reggae musicians um, speak to oppression and overcoming it and overcoming down, uh, down pressers and equal rights and justice, um, fighting apartheid. Uh, and um, so these, they've written these amazing anth anthems for civil rights. And one of the most popular of Peter Tosh's is this song, 400 years, which um, tells us not only about the Jamaican experience, but it's absolutely relevant to the uh, American experience uh, as well. So if we take the second line from that song, 400 years, sung by the backing vocals, uh, we can get into the uh, American experience and, and we can ask, well, who were the old pirates that sold 12 and a half million Africans to the merchant ships to bring them, some of them, to uh, a land where all men uh, would declare to be equal, uh, except for those declared to be three-fifths of a person uh, to drive these slave-based uh, agricultural uh, plantation-based uh, economies. And <clears throat> I, I met Mary Jackson in a crafts market in, in Charleston, South Carolina, in a place where humans were bought and sold, uh, just like baskets. Um, and, and so her artwork today gives us both a, a legacy, to, an insight into the past, but also a, a forward um, movement just in the beauty of her artistry. So um, she preserves the history and, and moves us uh, forward. She's a living legend. So just like Jamaica, United States has fought against itself on, on a great many uh, occasions um, in, in different ways. And, and certainly um, the, the Civil War is the greatest of that. But even with you know, the Emancipation Proclamation and, and the Civil War, it, it wasn't a, a peaceful transition to a more perfect union. And so these other atrocities and terroristic actions uh, took place, um, which necessitated earlier iterations of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, for example, Ida B. Wells' anti-lynching campaign. And it's really here that, that one has to think and take a historical perspective of all these different uh, Black Lives Matter-esque movements, they don't, they don't ask for Spanish boots made of Spanish leather. They just ask for fundamental human dignities, not to be enslaved, not to be lynched, not to be segregated, um, not that whistling at someone is a death sentence for a 14-year-old boy. Um, questions 
and things that shouldn't have to be asked for and certainly shouldn't have to be died for uh, because they're just fundamental. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> Wells's campaign this is not only about the lynching. Um, it, it, it's about what happened in society during those, uh, during those times. And that's recorded and chronicled in, in this, the worst book that I own, uh, which I still keep 20 years later in its uh, packing content because it, it's, just, it's just so horrific. Um, and, and what this speaks to is the fact that uh, lynchings were sport and, 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 and social activities. So at a lynching, photographers would gather, uh, people would gather, and people would have their pictures taken to make postcards, and they would write to friends and family uh, across the nation. Um, and it, it, it's mind-boggling that uh, you could act in, in, in this way in, in, at such a, um, at a terrible occasion. Um, the, the foreword to this book was written by the late uh, Congressman uh, John Lewis, and it's a really uh, important book. After that, we have an era of segregation. And, and despite all of these atrocities o over centuries, you know, uh, Marian Anderson, uh, banned from singing in certain venues, still finds it uh, in herself to uh, sing uh, on the steps of the uh, Lincoln Memorial. My country tis of thee, right? Um, sweet land of liberty. The music of Dizzy and, and Miles, it's, it's like Bob Marley and, and, and Peter Tosh. It, it absolutely insists new freedoms uh, and in, its, in its music. And, and these sort of lean back and blow moments uh, are a freedom of the soul and the mind that nobody can take away with whatever atrocity um, you, you care to have. So in this moment, you're free. Um, and, and the poetry of, of, of Langston Hughes makes the same, uh, same recognition that it's, it's not only that uh, you're American, but you're also beautiful. And those that commit these atrocities uh, should be ashamed. And, and, <clears throat> you can immerse yourself uh, in, in this history and, and walk through these um, uh, four or 500 years at the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of African American uh, History and, and Culture. And if you do that, if you go uh, into this building, what you find is not only the American story, but part of the Jamaican story as well. So there are displays uh, talking about Rastafarianism and Bob Marley and, and uh, Marcus Garvey, all right? Um, in terms of both music and the politics. And, and so what you find is that the American experience and the Jamaican experience, these are not uh, just exclusive. They, they are connected and intertwined over these entire 400 years and connected. Um, and, and so this anthem um, resonates in, in both uh, countries. Um, and, and these lines from this anthem pop up on social media all the time, 400 years, 400 years. What is less often quoted from this song is the third line, that it's the same philosophy. Right? And I think we're at a time uh, in, in American culture where with the, uh, this latest iteration of Black Lives Matter movement is it is a rejection of this third line. It is, no, it's, it's not gonna be the uh, uh, same philosophy for the next 400 years. Um, and so we are going to embrace additional lines from this, uh, and we're gonna say the time has come, and there is this movement. And not only a national movement, the, uh, you know, across the entire nation in a hashtag that everyone can popularize, but a personal movement. What am I going to do as an individual uh, to tap into that and, and connect uh, to that? And so that what gets me here, um, the discussion uh, of uh, my essay using uh, considering the properties of light and wavelengths of light uh, to inform the human condition and see how we connect to Black Lives Matter and in the making of a personal movement. And so it's here uh, that I can reach a point uh, where I can thank Karen for this introduction and CHSS and 
thank you to all the participants who have logged in. And so uh, we will go on this uh, journey together and uh, explore the human uh, condition. So for those of you who are not familiar uh, with the Green Orange Cafe, um, my essays are uh, very formulaic, uh, kind of like episodes of Star Trek or the fact that um, Othello, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet uh, and Macbeth are the same Shakespearean play, uh, but they're not. And, and so what I start with is a scientific principle. I'll connect that scientific principle to a personal experience and then relate that to things that are seemingly unrelated and then we'll revisit the principle. And there's an absolute insistence in this essay structure that we end on a hopeful, optimistic, or humorous conclusion. So, um, so I promise you that. And, but there's not gonna be a lot of humor given this subject matter. And so I'll give you the humor now um, in, in, by way of thanking Kyle Davis, who's an ABT uh, graduate. And, um, you know, the sort of the angel of mercy is always on time. I was working on this essay and um, Cal needed a letter of recommendation, write it when I was writing it and it brought us together. And so his reflection on this essay became a guide to how you might want to interpret this essay. And so that's posted uh, on the blog as well. So I, I really couldn't have done this without Kyle's uh, input and I'm uh, deeply grateful. Uh, for that. And so how we go forward uh, in this is a series of vignettes, uh, all considering uh, some aspects of, of light. And so um, the first one is seeing the light of day. So a double rainbow on uh, June 13th, 2016, in the windows area of uh, Arches National Park. So it's miraculous in itself um, in, in terms of a double rainbow in a place that gets seven inches of rain a year. And so um, very rare to see rainbows in Arches National Park. What's more miraculous though is, is that it was June 13th, 2016. And what, what makes that significant is because all across the world, the Eiffel Tower, you know, um, Tower Bridge in, in London, the White House, buildings all across the nation were on that day being illuminated in rainbow colored light because the day before, uh, on June 12th, 49 people had been murdered in the Pulse Bar in, in Orlando, Florida. And, and so the world was standing in solidarity with the LGBTQ uh, community. And, you know, there's <laughs> certain aspects of when a time is, is necessary and the universe uh, wants you to do something and pay attention, it's gonna put rainbows in a desert um, so you can uh, be there together uh, with this movement, whether you like it or not. And so that gives, uh, that brings us to two very important questions, right, and particularly, uh, related uh, to that uh, massacre in, in Orlando and then for going forward. Have you ever suffered persecution just for being who you are, right? And if you can't answer yes to that question, then consider the second question. Have you ever stood in solidarity with people who have been persecuted just for being who they are? And what's important to recognize uh, and not feel guilty about is that these are these are these can be separate groups um, and they're not interchangeable and if you're one and, and not the other um, that's fine so long as these groups have empathy for one another they can work in solidarity um, and they can form more perfect unions and going forward we can get to a peaceful place right tranquil solitude but as every, just about every reggae anthem ever written will remind us, right? Is that um, the redemption comes after the tribulation. So it's important in, in, uh, in sunrise in Canyon Lands National Park in, in Utah uh, to, to remember that this tranquility 
was born of violence, right? And so if we go uh, and zoom in to the surface of the sun, well, what we'll find is that 98% of the matter uh, of the solar system is the sun. And it's just this ultra violent fusion reaction converting hydrogen to helium uh, in, in, in just energy that we cannot even imagine. Uh, and as these sort of dragons of flames fly off the surface of the sun, the light that illuminates our world comes from here. And every photon of light released from the surface of the sun travels 93 million miles, and it takes eight minutes and 20 seconds to illuminate our planet. And we perceive it as tranquil solitude, despite its violent uh, genesis. But if you are together with someone, uh, who you love and the chemistry between you as such, um, and you're thinking about the future, questions will be asked. And if answered in the affirmative, then it will lead you to uh, occasions like this, Christchurch Cathedral uh, in, in Lexington. So what I need to tell you now though, is how racism almost destroyed this particular moment. Right. And so that wasn't the first time uh, I considered marriage. Uh, the first time I considered marriage was when I was a graduate student at uh, Penn State, uh, which is a great place to do uh, graduate school. And in the year of the 25th anniversary of Loving versus Virginia, the Supreme Court decision to legalize interracial marriages, uh, I wanted to get married. Um, and, and so um, we met with um, the parents uh, of my then girlfriend. Um, and they said, remind us again who your parents are, uh, which I did. Uh, and, and they said, well, we're sure that they are lovely people, which they are. Um, and they said, well, what happens if when you start to form a family, that all your dad's black genes come out all at once in our grandchildren and our daughter gives birth to a black baby. So um, you can imagine uh, in a situation like this, um, anger <laughs> might, might rise up, but you've, you've got to suppress that. Um, you got to do something else uh, that's productive. Anger really is. You got to promise yourself that if you ever get a chance to teach genetics, um, you'll take that opportunity. And more than that, you'll embrace science, not only to get rid of racism, but to absolutely dismantle the, the, the concept of race itself. Um, and, and so um, it's kind of what I've done. Uh, because we, in order to get peace on earth, we need to transcend race and we need to get to this world perspective, right? Uh, and, and so we can use science to, to help us get to this goal. The, the other question I had to ask uh, in, this, in, in this situation was, how angry was I going to be uh, at my then girlfriend um, for statements and actions of her parents? Were I going to blame her um, or not? And so it's kind of a good thing I didn't because she went to uh, Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, to do, pursue her PhD. And um, you know, in all the hurt and confusion of that, that all precipitated, um, you just need time to, to rebuild two lives. And she went her way and I went mine and about, and then we healed and, and we went on with our lives. But about a year later, um, she called me and she said, you'd really like California and you should come out and visit, uh, see, meet people, uh, see if there's opportunities uh, for you when you uh, finish graduate school. So I did and I went and visited and uh, I met uh, Andrew Otis Jackson, uh, who's a plant virologist and he offered me a postdoctoral fellowship on the spot, even though I was only one year into my uh, PhD. And um, but I ultimately uh, got to Berkeley and, and did my postdoc 
and that led to a, a return to that beach um, with Angelica and in a scene that had uh, baguettes and cheese and wine and um, ultimately to Canyonlands, Utah at a sunrise and, and certain questions were asked and uh, answered in the affirmative uh, such that we were able to bring uh, Jamaican and German and American and Canadian families uh, together into this union. And um, so at the time that this was all going on, um, then Said Gabriel uh, uh, the, uh, from UK uh, did a sabbatical at Berkeley. And he said, you know, there's this position that's gonna open up, you should apply for it. And I did, and that's what led me down uh, this road um, and to this building. And, and that is part of the story um, of how I became faculty at UK and, and subsequently a professor at this university. And that story and, and some other um, ideas on the chemistry of love is, is chronicled in, in this essay, uh, Love in the Time of Coronavirus. But now that I'm at UK and I'm a, a a uh, virologist and a researcher. I want to tell you a little about how my uh, research in, in plant viruses got me to thinking about how humans may uh, form more perfect unions. And so that's uh, this vignette uh, called uh, Dancing in the Glow. And it's, um, well, a lot of my research requires uh, microscopy and this instrumentation is about to get a significant upgrade. So that's pretty cool. Um, will allow us to do more great things. But the, the love story, um, if, if you look through um, the eyepiece here, what you'll see uh, in these uh, cells are these beautiful uh, green membranes. And that allows us to, to look at uh, cellular functions in, in a number of different ways. And uh, the, the reason these cell membranes are green is because of another love story. Uh, that I need to tell you about, sort of the love story in a jellyfish version. So uh, these jelly, particular jellyfish, um, they live in really dark waters of the Pacific. And, and so they make, um, th they make glow-in-the-dark proteins, fluorescent proteins, for the same reason that humans go to nightclubs, right? And so they make this protein called green fluorescent protein. It absorbs blue light, it emits green light. And, um, Jellyfish uh, and other things, like humans, are attracted to things that glow. And, and so things attracted to this jellyfish that are not jellyfish might become food, and things that are attracted uh, to the jellyfish that are other jellyfish become mates. So it's basically uh, nightclub life uh, in a nutshell. Um, but what's cool about these green fluorescent proteins is that you can take the gene out and you can engineer it into just about anything you want, bacteria, plants, animals. Um, and you can make them glow green and do cool cell biology. Uh, but one color is just not enough. You can't, green can't tell you the whole entire story. And so you've got to have sort of allies, if you will, of other type of fluorescent proteins that are going to work synergistically um, and cooperatively. And uh, luckily for us, there's a whole slew of these proteins. And I'll show you one of them. There's another protein called red fluorescent protein. And similar to GFP, it absorbs green and emits red, such that you can start to mark different parts uh, of the cell in different colors, and that's, that's really cool. So every micrograph becomes more informative than if you just had one color, and that's great. Um, what's really important uh, to pay attention to, both in terms of fluorescent proteins and humans, is that the light that GFP and RFP are, are capable of giving and receiving, they're, they're, it's not interchangeable. And so the blue light and the green light of GFP are different from the green light uh, and, and the red light of RFP. Um, and the green light from GFP is not the one that RFP actually needs. Um, and so they can't be one another. They're like those two groups uh, uh, earlier. Um, and, but they can, because of their different characteristics, if they each get the wavelength they need, they can work effectively in partnerships. They can be allies. And if these were humans, the way they get to be allies and to work harmoniously together and form 
perfect unions, if you will, um, requires another fundamental aspect uh, of light. And so um, that's the wavelength of empathy, uh, the ability to feel warmth. So um, maybe some of you have been cold in August and not because of the air conditioning, sort of the, you know, you, you walk past someone and they inspect the sidewalk. Um, you walk into a room, conversation stops and you're not included, that, that kind of cold. Um, and so how do you um, be not cold in, in that scenario? Well, if you're physically cold, you can have a space heater. And what warms you in a space heater is not the visible light that the heating coils put out. It's the invisible uh, infrared radiation, right? And so that contacts you and, and you feel warm. And, and empathy is the same thing. You can't see it. It's just this radiation of warmth, you know, that you say good morning and someone actually returns uh, good morning or um, you know, that, that coworker, or, or you look into their eyes and you can see that there's something beyond just their eyes. You can start to see into their soul uh, a, a little bit. And, and so this, this empathy is really what we need to bring our uh, groups together. Um, and whether it's unions of two people uh, or it's unions of 328 million, right? Empathy is absolutely critical for forming perfect unions. Because in the case of two people, um, these unions end about 37% of the time, um, even among people uh, that said they love each other. Um, and so when you get to 328 million, the, this, this order of scale, but the same principles apply. And both for unions of two, and unions of 328 million, unfortunately, there are these violent uh, uh, characteristics, right? And so domestic violence is rampant and we have to be, uh, have empathy for the people who are going through this. And it's rampant to the degree that we actually have uh, at UK a center for research on violence against women. And the problem is not that this center exists, it is the problem that it has to exist given the prevalence of this type of violence. Um, and so um, we really have to maintain empathy for everyone we meet. We do not know their backstories. Um, we don't want to make assumptions about why they don't respond in a way we think they should. Um, because there are multiple revolutions taking place in real time at the same time, all at different wavelengths. And they may be two people trying to work it out on a park bench and there may be um, larger crowds and activism on that scale. Um, but we have to have empathy for both. And this idea that humans respond to stimuli in a wavelength dependent manner is, is, not, is not new to my essay, not new to me. Um, and this sort of force of attraction between two groups that gets less and less the more you space them out. Um, I mean, politicians, it's necessary and they've perfected um, the ability to capitalize on the polarization that eliminates the ability to have a reciprocal empathy between two groups. Uh, they polarize rather than bring these unions together. And the problem is, the critical problem for individuals and nations is that if this polarization and lack of communication gets far enough apart and you can no longer feel empathy for the other side, then that's a certain definition of darkness. And so darkness is not only the absence of light, it's the failure of light to illuminate, right, if you will. And so when this happens, we fall into these dark states. The killing of George Floyd is one of those states that put us into darkness. It took eight minutes and 46 seconds to kill George Floyd. And that is 26 seconds longer than it takes a photon to leave the sun, to travel 93 million miles to illuminate the earth. If you want to get a sense of just how long that is, You've got to sit in a darkened room and see if you can sit still and quiet 
for eight minutes and 46 seconds. It's an eternity. And however you feel about this situation, what you have to come to realize is whatever arrest or restraint needed to be made, it's kind of impossible that it needed to take that long. And so with this action, we fell into darkness and into a blackout. So I have to tell you that, um, I have to stop here for a second and tell you that if this is the structure of how you write essays and you make a promise that you're gonna end in a hopeful or optimistic or humorous conclusion, and you write yourself into a blackout situation when you're trying to write an essay about light, um, it's a problem. And how do you work out of this darkness? And how do you go forward to get to this hopeful, optimistic place that I promise you we will get to? And in these blackout situations, as people and nations find themselves in, uh, as we do now, uh, from time to time in history, all too often, all too often throughout the course of history, it takes some violent action to move us in the direction that we need to go. And we need to ask why it, it, it requires this violence or does it? Um, and so Brianna Taylor was asleep in her own bed, in her own domicile with her own partner and into that were fired 22 shots, eight of which uh, hit her, so that when she awoke, she was in heaven. And this, this happens all too often in history. Uh, and uh, why? And it happens to the degree that poets keep reminding us about it in their poems, in their songs, like the troubadour Bruce Coburn. Um, yet some people just never see the light and then shines through bullet holes and, and why? And the, the question we need to ask ourselves is that, well, if the only light we have is coming through bullet holes, then it is for each and every one of us to plant something in that stream of light that can photosynthesize, to give us something that we can harvest in our lifetime or in our children's lifetime that gets us towards that more perfect union. And each and every one of us has to make that action. And so we ask ourselves, um, you know, well, what's that tomorrow gonna look like? And just, just sketch it out for yourselves as an individual, you know, not to be influenced by anyone else, just say to yourself, well, what's this gonna look like? So just ask yourself some simple questions. Who would you cast in bronze or carbon stone that would be revered and respected a century from now? So personally, um, I'd like to see a statue of Percy Julian on campus. Um, first, just a great story. Uh, first um, African-American to be inducted into the uh, National Academy of Sciences and great story. He's the chemist that I could never become. And uh, are we ready? Uh, in Lexington for a redemption song by Laura Facey in our downtown. If I, if I were to win the Powerball, um, I would acquire the entire Hank uh, Willis Thomas uh, collection and I would offer to buy uh, uh, and purchase a, a new wing on our art gallery. This is uh, one of the most uh, important artists of our day. What mural uh, would you uh, paint uh, on the many blank walls available? That would be inspirational 70 years from now. We have oceans of blank wall and we have great talent in our uh, faculty, staff and students um, from professional to amateur and everything in between. And there's a great opportunity um, to use my photographic arts uh, and we can tell each other our own stories and, and build community uh, with, with what we do and share with each other. Um, and that would be great. We have to break bread figuratively and literally. And uh, I've addressed that um, with others who are not like us. And I've addressed that in this essay, um, bread and all the things we need to uh, form a more perfect union. Uh, <clears throat> What meal would you prepare to share at a table? 
ultimately this country has to be one table with a seat for everyone around it. So what are you going to bring to that table, uh, literally and, and figuratively? Um, so we, in our program, um, what greater way to celebrate uh, students than with food? Um, and certainly in the College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, we know that food is, is that's better than any textbook you can bring into a classroom. We can teach through food and build community at the same time. I need that SARS-CoV-2 vaccine so I can get back to my coffee diplomacy. My goal is to have a cup of coffee with uh, every person that I meet. I'm doing a good job so far. Um, and <clears throat> what lines would you write on the blank pages of today? So um, that would resonate with future generations. I don't know about future generations, but um, those who have encouraged me to write these uh, essays uh, have been it just it's been a great experience and uh to the degree that they're being embraced by students and we can actually use them for teaching tools um and uh, we're doing that experiment so who knew that a simple article about how coffee was discovered could allow one to explore the entire world uh, we can do this uh, with essays like this and finally uh in situations so painful as this forgiveness is essential. So who are you going to forgive? So you no longer have to have that anger uh, eat away at your soul. And um, so the, the parents uh, of my ex-girlfriend uh, were forgiven a long time ago because their actions led me to this really remarkable life. So I, I need to address Black Lives Matter directly uh, in the remainder of this talk. This is a cultural and social transformation that is occurring. And it's got a, th this group of women uh, has this historical uh, legacy that goes back to Ida B. Wells and, and it's one more iteration of uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movements. And so each of us has to figure out a way to connect to this movement oh, over and above uh, forwarding hashtags. Um, what are you going to do personally to make uh, a connection to this? And, and for me, uh, I think I'm at a little different wavelength. And, and so I need to connect to it by my own wavelength, uh, maybe not directly. And, and, and the reason being, I've never been satisfied with the name of this movement. And I, I, I'll tell you why. Because I didn't grow up two miles from Bob Marley's house just so that Black Lives could just matter. And I, I, I wasn't weaned uh, on the music of Peter Tosh, just that so Black Lives could only matter and just meet the basic dignities. So I, I wrote an essay that uses the properties of light to inform the human condition, right? So that gives me something I can do now, right? Because I can convert matter to M, and then I can take light from my essay and square it. And I get MC squared, uh, C being the speed of light, which gives me black lives energy. And I'm going to use that light and that energy to show you that if you illuminate the human skull, what you get is a shadow in the shape of the continent of Africa. And I'm going to tell you that the cradle of humankind is Africa and that the Rastafarians had it right all along and now they're backed by science because humans are a monophyletic lineage rooted in Africa. And um, I wrote an essay uh, on backed by science and genetics. And I'll tell you, the take home point is that there are two things that came out of Africa, coffee and humans. And when they both left, they were black when they left. And that, truth backed by science um, may be more bitter than this coffee for some people to, to handle. Um, and until you can accept that, and if you can't right now, then wait, then there's something else. If you can't handle that, then you need to do this. You need to go and stand where he stood. And you need to have your children stand where he stood. And you need to walk down the National Mall to the 30 foot Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. statue. And with him at your back, you have to realize that to the left is the Lincoln Memorial. 
And to the right, equidistant is the Jefferson Memorial. And equidistant in front of you is the Washington Memorial. And what you have to realize is that black lives don't just matter. They are the cornerstone of the foundation upon which this nation rests. And those privileges and uh, created equal sentiments apply to everyone. And if you look in the direction of this statue forward to the Washington uh, Monument and look behind it, then that's where the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture is. And you need to go there and immerse yourself in these centuries of history and learn it and feel it. And then you can emancipate yourself from mental slavery because none but ourselves can free our minds. And then we get to return to that beach where we started. And you can see that life is an open sea, not just for any one particular group, but all. And then we can realize the promise of a dream <clears throat> that all little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And that is the only conclusion acceptable to the Green Orange Cafe. Sila, amen. Thank you.